Okay, no questions? Everybody's perfectly happy with their and then stuff? Okay, that's surprising to me, but I'm happy for you. Um, last time, we couldn't go through all of the um, RNN examples, but I mentioned that um, notebooks are available, and uh, different notebooks have examples of doing things uh, in different ways. In particular, I just want to mention, uh, if you have any questions, you can uh, look at this offline. Uh, the RNN tutorial notebook basically builds an LSTM from scratch, does not use the cool DNN's RNN forward uh, function. Instead, builds a LSTM in pure Julia and builds a sequence to sequence model out of it. And this sequence to sequence model is built to um, memorize English words character by character um, and reverse them in, the, in this particular example. And it solves the mini batching problem by sorting words by their length so that uh, similarly length uh, words are grouped together so there are no mini batches that have um, uh, different size sequences. The sentiment analysis one uh, we looked at. Uh, in that one we had IMDB movie reviews and these movie reviews were padded to be the same length. Uh, each token in those sequences were representing uh, integers representing words um, and the problem was sequence classification. Again, the mini batching was easy because we padded everything and the, all the sequences were the same length. Um, in the character based language model, uh, we have, uh, we download the complete works of Shakespeare uh, and then turn it into a huge sequence, character, character by character sequence, and uh, we chop up that sequence into equal lengths without any regard for word boundaries or sentence boundaries and then we put them into mini batches um, and uh, create a character based language model using RNN forward so this is a simple application of um, the RNN forward function where again the mini batching is simple and we're feeding RNN forward with these three dimensional tensors representing the whole mini batch of sequences and finally, in the RNN language model, we have a word-based language model instead of a character-based one. Uh, by the way, whenever I say language model, what I mean is an RNN that basically reads the last n minus one tokens and then tries to predict the next token. Okay, so that's what a language model is. Um, in the RNN language model case, I believe we have um, sentences of different lengths and it shows you an example of how to create mini batches out of sequences of uh, differing lengths and it uses the batch sizes argument of RNA forward to um, convey that information to the uh, underlying RNA. Uh, one thing that Amer wanted me to remind you is that when we're trying to uh, mini batch sequences of different length or in fact mini batch any uh, sequence problem um, a common mistake was let's see if I still have my mini batching slide there we go so here's my mini batching slide um, so well, this is actually too dirty let's, let's create a new one So let's say I have a sentence one here, word one one, word one two, word one, you know, L one. Sentence two here, word two one, word two two, you know, word two, L two, where L two and L one are the lengths of the sentences. Um, so if this is the thing you're trying to mini-batch, then you actually mini-batch going this way first. So in particular, uh, the input that you feed to RNN forward should have the embeddings of word 1-1, one, one, word 2-1, one, word 3-1, all the first words, 
followed by all the second words, followed by all the third words, etc. Uh, so when you put it in this order, then all the first words will actually um, include B1 examples. B1 will be the size of your first uh, mini batch and all the second words will be B2. If all your sequences are greater than of length 3, then B1 and B2 are equal, but sometimes B2 is going to be less because some of the shorter sequences will start B3. So in this case, um, the batch sizes argument is going to be B1, B2, B3, etc. telling the um, library uh, what the lengths of the different batches are. So we're not giving the lengths of the different sentences here, and we're not actually sorting the sentences, um, you know, putting one sentence after another uh, in that order here. Instead, we're putting all the first words, all the second words, and these BIs actually represent the number of first words, the number of second words, etc. Okay? So this is something that everybody is comfortable with. All right. So um, today I'm going to talk about debugging machine learning models and uh, give some practical advice. Um, it's not a very mathematical lecture, but it's an important lecture before you actually embark on your uh, projects uh, because you're going to write a baseline algorithm soon to March 23rd, which is supposed to be an end-to-end -end model that actually takes your data and delivers some loss, um, which can do some training, but it doesn't have to perform as well. It can be a very simple linear model, for example. Um, and then after that, quickly, you're going to try to replicate uh, the results of the paper you're working on. And while you're doing that, you know, some things are going to go wrong. Some of the hyperparameters is not going to be specified. You're not going to get the same results. Um, in any machine learning problem, your first attempts are likely to fail. So when they fail, uh, instead of trying random things, uh, it would be good to learn how to diagnose the problem, how to learn uh, different types of problems that can cause you to have bad performance and how to deal with each one specifically. So I'm going to start with a couple of examples from uh, Andrew Ng. Uh, but first, let me go over the different readings for this chapter, which I think are very important. Um, so first of all, your textbook devotes a whole, whole chapter to practical methodology. That's a chapter well worth reading. It has a lot of useful information. Uh, this is um, some examples from Andrew Ng. Uh, which are, we're going to go over today. Uh, he also has a book called Machine Learning Yearning, it's, which is written for business people. Okay, this book is not very technical, but it does tell you about, uh, for example, you know, if you were trying to build a startup that will recognize cat pictures or something, and your model is not performing very well, you know, how would you uh, improve it? Would you try... Uh, collecting more data or, you know, using a bigger neural network, um, you know, running the optimization algorithm longer, etc. There's many, many different ways that you can try to fix such an um, issue. So in this particular practical example, uh, he basically teaches you how to diagnose various problems and how to cope with them. Well worth the read, it's just uh, like 20 pages or so. Um, but I'm going to start with um, Andrew Ng's examples. So let's have an interactive class. I'm going to ask you questions um, and uh, and before the end of the class I'm going to try to hit the following topics. Let's, let's make a list so I don't forget. So we're going to we already have talked about overfitting and underfitting a lot. And we're going to talk about that some more. Um, I want to talk about 
uh, metrics, evaluation metrics, uh, hypothesis testing, where we ask whether one algorithm is better than the other and how to actually argue that um, in a statistically um, valid manner. How to pick an objective function and whether the objective function you pick actually represents what you want to optimize and problems related to that. Um, the difference between parameters versus hyperparameters and their optimization. Um, I'm going to talk about ensembles and uh, why they actually might add to your uh, performance. I'm going to talk about the train dev test um, data distributions. Okay, so let's see how many of these topics I can hit. Um, so our first example is uh, a spam detector, which used to be a very important problem 10 years ago. Now it's mostly solved, so um, maybe not interesting anymore. But uh, the, the goal here was basically you, read, you look at the words and other pro properties of an email, and you try to distinguish whether it's a legitimate email or a spam. Um, because all the big email companies, Google, etc., were interested in uh, you know filtering your spam emails for you. And at one point in time, you know, 90% of all the email traffic was spam. So if actually they did not do that for you, you would basically be unable to use your uh, mailbox for anything useful. So it used to be a uh, important problem. So one thing that uh, a simple method that you might try is uh, you pick some words that are very indicative of spam, you know, such as, you know, dollars, grades, you know, whatever. You look at a bunch of spam examples and you pick a hundred uh, words to use as features instead of dumping all 50,000 plus English words onto your model. And uh, we try a linear model here named Bayesian logistic regression. So I want you to, uh, look at this Bayesian logistic regression and actually uh, see that it's equivalent to a softmax model with uh, L2 normalization. Okay, so it's, it's in, in the language that we were used to. So here is the L2 normalization factor. Uh, here is the maximizing of log probabilities of the correct answers. And this is, um, we usually do the negative of this and try to minimize the loss instead this is actually uh, proposing to maximize this objective function. Okay. Now, you try this linear model and then you get a very large error, 20% on the test set. What do we do? Where do we go from here? This is the typical situation we find ourselves in. Um, here are some ideas. You, you might actually come up with more. Uh, so, you know, getting more examples is always a good idea. Uh, changing the feature set, uh, trying to make the feature set smaller or larger, getting more words in there, different types of features. Um, getting features instead of just the words, getting features from the email header, like the sender, the date, etc. cetera. Um, and then there might be problems with optimization, so maybe this thing didn't converge, so maybe we should run SGD for more iterations to see if things improve. We should maybe we should use second order methods like the Newton's method or Adam and Adegrad and all these other optimization algorithms that might work better. Try a different learning rate. Um, we tried um, regularization with lambda, the L2 regularization. Uh, maybe that backfired, so we might actually change our lambda. And uh, you know, if nothing works, we might try a completely different algorithm. Here, you know, it's just an SVM. Maybe we'll uh, do a deeper neural network or something. Uh, typically, um, you know, when my grad students are faced with a problem like this, they flip a coin and they try things randomly. 
and they do that for a couple months um, until they realize that you know that uh, is a very long and arduous road. I mean, if we have in time, eventually we hit on the right answer. But each of trying each of these things takes a lot of time. So instead of picking random actions, we should try to find out what the problem is, and then uh, customize our solution based on the problem. So how can we do that? Well, we learned one way of doing that, which is uh, looking at the learning curves, right? So the learning curves tell us how the loss of the training set versus the validation set changes and whether there is overfitting or underfitting. Um, so here's a different type of learning curve. Typically, uh, in our diagnosis, we used the number of epochs on the x-axis um, and the error on the y-axis. Uh, this one looks different because the x-axis is different. The x-axis is training set size. Okay? So this is basically saying, forget about you know, applying more epochs or whatever. Run your algorithm under conver uh, until convergence. Assume we don't have a problem with optimization. Let's see how things change when we change the data set size. It does more data really help? You might say, well, I don't have more data. How can I draw this graph? Well, then use half of the data you have, and then quarter of the data you have, and then draw something like this. The x-axis here is typically logarithmic. Uh, you want to change your data um, size, you know, multiples of two or something. Now, if this is the training size, how can we explain, okay, so the Test error is coming down, which is nice, which is expected, right? The more data, the better. How come the training error is going up? Yeah? Because you need to learn more things while training. Right. So fitting a smaller training set is easier, right? Uh, fitting a smaller training set means you know, just memorizing the answers for, a, for the training set. So if you have 10 examples in your training set, any you know, small neural network can learn to fit those 10 examples. But if you have 10 million, it's much harder to get 99% you know, accuracy on 10 million uh, training sets. So, since, uh, so here, basically, we're memorizing the answers. And here, it's becoming harder and harder to memorize the answers. And uh, that's why the training error is going up. Um, so, Looking at this picture, what would you recommend? What should we do? Yeah. yeah? Uh, is the training error increasing automatically? It doesn't have to. But typically, you would expect more data to make the training harder. So, what kind of problems do you see here? What kind of solutions would you recommend? Yeah. And we might uh, increase the model complexity. Okay, so why would you want to increase model complexity in this case? What? Because my model is not very powerful to learn the training set very well. Okay, okay. Um, any other ideas? Yeah. Also, there is kind of overfitting problem because it does case 10 training errors are. Okay, so if there is overfitting, would you like to increase or decrease the model complexity? Uh, if this is overfitting, uh, I don't know. Uh, I would take to the... No, you should know. No, no, no. You can't say I don't know. <laughs> There's two options. You have to stick with one. Increase, but to some extent. Decrease. So, for decrease example, I number of hidden layers, number of hidden units. If we see overfitting, do we increase them or decrease them? Decrease. Decrease them. Yes, overfitting means your, your model is already too complicated. Yes. It's already memorizing things that it shouldn't. So we should try to reduce model complexity as one solution. So there, I have two opposing advice <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think this is fine. We just have to get more training data. Okay, getting more training data seems like it's going to help because we haven't actually reached the limit yet, it seems like. Any other ideas? Yeah? I think it can be due to parameter parameterization. Lambda. The lambda. So, do you think the lambda is too big here or too small? Or too big. <coughs> lambda is too big. Why are you saying that? Because we analyze parameters. Uh -huh. and, uh, they don't have how much the real fitting volume. 
So you're saying the lambda is too big and that's why my training error is too high. Is that what you're saying? But also notice that there is a big gap between train and test, which uh, still points to overfitting. And in order to fight overfitting, what would you do with lambda? I don't think. Increase, right. So do we increase lambda or decrease lambda looking at this graph? So we're, we're, we're stuck now looking at this. Okay, so, so let's assume that uh, sometimes training error can never be zero. Why? Because of noise in the data set. So if there's any noise in the data set, so that means the, the input parameter, the inputs you have, the x's you have, don't uniquely determine the correct answer. Okay? So maybe there is some missing features in your data, for example. So that means seeing the exact same x input is sometimes going to give you spam and sometimes going to give you not spam. Okay? So if you are dealing with such a problem, then you never expect to get zero training error because the training set can't, itself can't decide whether a particular x should be positive or negative. Right? So the best you can hope for is what's known as the Bayes error rate, which is basically you're choosing the higher probability answer for every instance. But even if you did that, your error would be uh, non-zero. So let's assume uh, this is not underfitting, but it's basically due to noise in the data set. So in that case, uh, this graph represents overfitting. In order to fight overfitting, we should either increase lambda, increase the training set size, um, decrease the model complexity. All of these things actually help overfitting. What about this one? Yeah? <coughs> uh, add more features with an increased complexity. Right, so here we don't have any overfitting because train and test pr practically converge to the same thing. So obviously, uh, our model or features being too rich and learning random noise is not the problem. Uh, but uh, the Performance that we have is not satisfactory. So in order to increase performance, if it is possible to increase performance, we need to increase uh, the capacity. Increasing, does increasing more, does adding more training data help in this case? No. Because it's already flattened out, right? So if I double the training size, it's still going to be at, at around the same. So when you have underfitting, um, then Increasing the training set size doesn't necessarily help. Okay. Um, but increasing model complexity uh, helps. Okay, so um, so Andrew Ng uses the terms bias and variance, but basically these roughly correspond to all fitting and under Variance is overfitting, bias is underfitting uh, in our in this discussion. So the first two methods, um, getting more training examples and a smaller set of features, decreasing the model complexity helps with variance or overfitting. Uh, the second two, increasing the larger uh, features, uh, increasing, uh, adding new features, making the model deeper, etc., will help. Um, underfitting. Now I want to briefly mention where this bias variance things come from. Uh, so okay, so here's a picture I found yesterday that sort of um, tells you what's going on and then I'll, I'll, I'll look at the math with you. So um, the target output or the target uh, parameters that you want is represented with this bullseye. So you want to hit the red uh, with the bullseye. 
Okay? Uh, the little blue dots is basically the results of your uh, training with um, uh, different data or different starting points, etc. So bias means no matter how hard you try, you're aiming wrong. You don't actually, you're not aiming the red dot, you're aiming someplace else. Okay? Why would that happen? Because, for example, let's say the actual function that generates the data is nonlinear, and we're trying to fit a linear uh, model to it. What happens in that case is even if our best linear model will not point to the red dot, it's going to point to someplace else. Okay? So that's bias. And in the high bias examples, the bottom two pictures, you see that uh, we're missing the red dot. We're basically shooting somewhere else. Okay? Um, whereas variance measures um, how, um, how far spread your various results are. Okay? So a linear model has low variance, which means if I actually resample on another data set, I'm going to practically find the same coefficients. Okay? The, the model is going to change very, very little. Whereas if I have an over-parameterized model, so if I'm fitting, you know, 10 points with a ninth degree polynomial or something, even if I move one of the points a little bit, my answers are going to change wildly. Okay? So that, that shows uh, the case of high variance. Um, why are these things called bias and variance? So let's uh, look at the math about this a little bit. So, um, so let's say the data is being generated by the function fx and then some noise around this. Okay, so let's call this noise epsilon. So nature basically, given an input x, calculates fx, adds some random noise to it, and then delivers you the output you see, which is the y for this x. Okay, so that's the process that generated your data. Now, your model uh, learns some f prime of x, f hat of x, I should say. But this f hat of x is not um, fixed. It's, it depends on the data set. If you sample the same size data set again, you're not going to find immediately this, uh, exactly the same f hat. So f hat itself has some variance in it. So this is, let's say, centered that expected value of f hat. But around that expected value, there is some, some variance. So let's say you ended up with f hat over here. And the distance between y and f hat, as you can see from this picture, is influenced by various things. Okay? So the, the distance between f of x and my expected f hat is the bias. Even my expected f hat is not basically pointing to the correct answer. Okay, so that's, that comes from the model bias. Uh, the fact that uh, my model set, my formula for f hat, does not include a solution that would overlap with the real f. Okay? But that's not the only reason for error. Another reason for error is um, y is not equal to f of x because of noise. So that part I haven't, I, I can't do anything about because that's um, data noise. And a third piece of it is the, the difference between the expected value of f hat versus um, the actual value of f hat I got from this particular data set. Now that difference is going to get reduced if I have more data, but we, we always work with finite amount of data. So for any finite amount of data, the particular f hat that I'm going to calculate is going to be slightly different. So all of these three things cause the error. Um, and basically, if you write, so let's assume we're doing quadratic loss. So we're interested in an expectation like um, y minus um, f hat of x uh, squared. Okay. 
And if you write this uh, and do some algebra that you saw on that um, slide, um, it turns out to be sum of three things, variance of f hat. Okay, so basically this over here plus uh, bias square. So um, of f hat again. So bias basically was the distance between the center of this circle and the center of this circle uh, plus um, the variance of the data sigma epsilon squared. Okay, so you can find the algebra on that slide, but it nicely decomposes into these three things. So this is called the variance, this is called the bias, and this is called the uh, data related um, noise. Variance increases if we have large model cap capacity. Low model capacities actually lead to low variance. So the first term is going to be small if we make the model simpler or if we regularize it better. Okay? The second term is related to is, is going is the opposite. Uh, richer models actually are more likely to include the real effects and have zero bias. But if we use simple models or very high regularization, then we're not going to easily uh, C f of x in our solution set. So bias works the other way and this is something that we can't eliminate because it's a property of the data. Okay. So given the finite amount of data we have, um, we have to basically find the best balance of these three things which is why it's called the bias and variance. So any questions about where this bias variance stuff is coming from? I gave that example, but uh, we can argue the same thing for any error. So basically, whatever we used to call, um, you know, overfitting, roughly can be called high variance because it's due to your model being too flexible and the finite amount of data, um, you know, giving giving you wildly different answers. Um, so yes, in this particular derivation, I use the quadratic loss, but that's not the point. The point is um, your error is always has these three different components that you're trying to balance. Uh, yeah. I guess you said increasing the date number of data points mm -hmm. also increases the variance. Decreases. I, okay, sorry. Right. I so was, it, at, at infinite data points, I would have no variance, right? right? I'm standard so I would have Right. Um, yeah. So imagine that my model f hat comes from a certain set of functions, and I'm trying to find exactly which function in this set maximizes the, uh, you know, objective for this particular data set. Uh, as the data set grows bigger and bigger, the answer to that is going to be more unique. Okay. Um, now. Here's, let's look at this other example. Uh, so SVM is another model that we haven't seen in this class. You may have seen this in uh, machine learning. Who took machine learning last semester? Did you guys see SVMs? Okay, so uh, it's a linear model with a different loss function. It's in, in the case, uh, it's using a linear kernel. So, He's saying in Bayesian logistic regression, we have 2% error on spam, 2% non-spam. 2% um, error on spam is okay, because we don't mind if some of the spam actually shows up in our inbox. But 2% error on non-spam is not okay, because these are actually important emails that basically tell us about our graduation date or you know journal article acceptance or whatever. And missing 2% of those is not acceptable. So you use an SVM and you get some better results. You get 10% on spam and 0.01% on non-spam, which you like a lot. Uh, but you're asking yourself, well, I like you know, logistic regression. It's you know, easier to train and stuff. 
Um, so how can I fix this problem? So now you know we're, we're actually in the optimization and loss function domain. Let's forget about the model and look at the loss function and the optimization. So first of all, uh, if I actually uh, plot my objective and number of epochs, did it converge or not? Here it looks like it didn't converge, but normally when you're looking at these things, it almost never, uh, it's, it's very, very difficult to actually tell convergence because the thing can actually look like it's getting steady and then it can overshoot again, etc. So it's hard to tell uh, when um, the optimization algorithm has converged. Um, another question is, here is the objective function of the uh, Bayesian logistic regression. But this is not the actual thing that I care about. What I care about is um, the accuracy. In fact, the weighted accuracy. Weighted accuracy meaning, you know, I want to weigh uh, the mistakes in non-spam emails more than the number of mistakes in spam emails. So I don't know how much more, but there is some, you know, value in my head. So it's a weighted accuracy. But weighted accuracy is something we can't use because it's not differentiable. So that's why I'm using this, you know, differentiable uh, function. Okay. Um, so if I, my objective function and the real objective I have in mind are different, uh, then I can actually ask the following question. I have two models. I know SVM is doing better than the uh, logistic regression model. Um, so basically the accuracy, the thing that I actually care about, is higher for SVM than the basic logistic regression. Then I can ask, okay, how about the actual loss? Because they both compute the same loss. I can both I can compute the same loss for, for both of these guys. Um, so ELR is trying to maximize this thing. I can ask, is the loss with the SVM parameters better or worse than the loss with the Bayesian logistic regression parameters? I know the accuracy in terms of accuracy, SVM is better. But in terms of loss, so let's say SVM is also better. What does that tell me? Versus um, SVM is worse. What does that tell me? So to summarize, you have two algorithms. One is better in accuracy. Okay? And I'm looking at, I'm comparing them in terms of the loss function I'm using to optimize. What conclusion should I draw if the loss function also points in the same direction versus the loss function points in the other direction? The other direction being the interesting one. So SVM is better in accuracy. A Bayesian logistic regression is better in loss. What does that tell me? The loss is better for SVM than SVM is a better model. Yes. It's greater, then I, it may be not a good model, but the criteria that we're maximizing is better for SVM. Um, the criteria that we're maximizing, which is alpha, loss function. Like alpha is better. What's alpha? A of theta. Oh, A of theta. Okay, so A, of, A, A is better for the SVM that we have established. Yeah, the accuracy of SVM is better. But now, if the, if the loss of SVM is worse, then what does that mean? Then PLR is better in explaining the data, but... But it's accuracy as well. Yeah? Are the objective functions identical? Um, no, but I'm looking at the, I'm interested in BLR, so I'm looking at the BLR objective function. So, SVM does not compute the objective function. But I can, but using SVM's parameters. on the loss that you were using to optimize, 
that tells you that your optimization did not actually do a very good job. Here's a set of weights found by a totally different algorithm, the SVM algorithm. And when you take these weights and apply your own loss function, then you realize that it actually gives you better loss than what you just found using your own training. So that means the training didn't work, the object, uh, the optimization didn't work, right? So there was a solution in your weight space with better loss, and the optimization could not find it. If it's the other way around, then we can't blame the optimization. The optimization algorithm actually gave you a better point in weight space in terms of your objective function, but yet this better point failed to increase your accuracy. So that means you're using the wrong objective. Right? So the difference between the actual thing you care about, which is accuracy, and the objective you're using, because it's differentiable, that difference is killing you. Okay? So what to do in these cases? So if you decide that optimization was the problem, namely there are better points in your weight space, or BLR, but your optimization procedure could not find them. How can we fix that? Well, then you try your optimization, you know, get your optimization toolbox out, and you run the gradient descent for more iterations because maybe it didn't converge. You try more restarts. You try Adam and Adagrad and RMS prop and all those things until you know, uh, you know, you basically start finding these better points in your weight space according to your current objective. If you, however, decide that uh, your optimization works fine, it's giving you some nice points, but the optimization objective is not aligned with your actual objective, then you need to change your objective. And here's at least two ways of changing the objective. First of all, regularization lambda changes the objective function, right? It's, it was part of the objective function that we basically set by hand. So maybe changing that will help with this problem or go to a totally different model with a different objective function like this here. Okay, that's the hardest uh, one to fix among all of them. Can I ask something? Yes, of course. Why are we using SVM as an alternative instead of other something else? This is just a toy example. You know, you know, substitute deep neural networks for SVM if you want. Is there a general comparison between SVM and deep networks? Um, in, sure, the reason deep networks actually became popular is basically SPM was not able to solve uh, problems like object recognition uh, to the same extent that SPM was. So with MNIST and stuff, you can get pretty far with SVM, but with ImageNet, you can't. Having multiple layers of representations actually um, seems to be important for those types of problems. Okay, so um, I'm gonna skip this example. Uh, it's basically doing the same thing. Uh, let me talk about error analysis a little bit. Um, so when you're looking at your papers, if it's a good paper, you will actually find some good error analysis in it because um, what you want from a machine learning paper is not, oh, I tried this method and it worked this well. Okay, so that's that's a totally, uh, there's a lot of papers like this, but they are bad, why? Because they don't teach you anything, okay? They don't teach you what would happen if you apply the same method to a slightly different problem, or what would happen if you apply the slightly different model to the same problem. They're giving you one data point in this whole model problem giant space without telling you anything about the context, okay? So what we want from an academic paper is actually to learn things so that you can apply what you learn to your own problem. And learning things is best accomplished with good error analysis after you actually have your model working. So here's a toy example again. Let's say you were doing face recognition um, or face classification. So we're imagining that we have various uh, modules here that do various things. Um, and each of them are optimized using machine learning. So there's the pre-processing step that removes anything that's not a face. 
and then you know face detection, um, and we segment the eyes, the nose, the mouth somehow, crop them, and then we feed the features of these things into some logistic regression or MLP, and at the end we get a label. So how, what would you do? Uh, what does error analysis mean in this case? There is two types. Uh, the first one, error analysis, basically asks the question, how much did each thing contribute um, to a baseline system? Okay. The second one, ablation analysis, answers the question, what would happen if I start removing different components from my model? Uh, which, which removal would actually impact the results the most? Okay. They're both important um, and informative. So, um, in error analysis, uh, what we want to do is we start with our system, which is currently doing 85%, and then we replace each component one at a time with a perfect version of that component. Maybe we hand draw the nose and the mouth and stuff instead of the segmentation. We, um, so, and here's the results we get. So if I start with the overall system, and then do pre-processing perfectly, then I get from 85 to 85.1. On top of that, if I actually do face detection perfectly, maybe I'm hand drawing all the faces now, replacing that module with a perfect version of itself, I go to 91. And then if I do eye perfectly, I go to 95, nose, mouth, and then finally, if I do everything perfectly, I get 100%. Do we understand this table? Yes. Because eyes, nose, and mouth segmentations are done in parallel, shouldn't we do like eyes, nose, mouth? No yes, eyes. so the, the ordering here is a bit arbitrary. So sometimes there is a natural ordering to things. Sometimes you, you may want to try different combinations of these things. But let's say we, we at least did this. Uh, looking at this, what does this table tell us? Well, this table tells us that if you could actually do pre-processing perfectly, you'd only get 0.1%. So let's not work on our pre-processing module, okay? By pre-processing, you mean? Removing of the background. Uh, if I was doing face detection perfectly, though, that's giving me 6%. So maybe I should spend some more time on my face detection module. That's a more significant gain there. So this type of analysis tells you uh, you know, if you make each of your modules perfect, which one would give you the biggest gain? And then that will basically direct you to um, optimize one model or another. John, yes? To do uh, an anal analysis like this, I need labels at the end of each block, right? Correct. You need the gold labels yes. uh, for each block. But if I don't have? Then this, this analysis becomes a lot harder unless you want to spend lots of time. So then, if, if that's the case, then we might actually look at the ablation analysis, which is always easier to do. It's, it's harder to replace parts of a model with a perfect thing. It's easier to replace parts of a model with nothing. Right, so, and um, replacing parts of a model with nothing is called ablative analysis. Uh, and this answers the question whether these components actually help. If a component is actually helping, then removing it should actually reduce our performance a lot. Okay? So, um, this is from the spam thing. Uh, yeah, spam classifier. Okay, so let's say uh, my system is doing very, very well, you know, 99.9%, and I'm trying to understand of all the tricks that I used to build the system, which ones are actually important, okay? Typically, you will see, you know, novice machine learning papers where they throw in the kitchen sink and, you know, everything, uh, and then basically they don't tell you which one actually did the trick. And then when you try to replicate the paper, you do your first MLP and you do better than their, you know, 20 component model, okay? So just because a model is complex does not mean all that complexity is actually necessary, okay? In order to understand um, and proceed in an informative fashion, you should start with simple models and see uh, what improves performance. Um, so in this case, we basically say, oh, if I remove spell correction from my thing, 
it basically loses 1%, right? If I remove you know, the sender host features in the header, very insignificant email header, not significant. Email text parser gives me nearly 4%. So this is the key component that basically explains my most of my success. Um, and then there's a couple things. So uh, the, the thing that gives you the crucial improvement over the baseline uh, in this case is the email text parser features. Question? When it says it's removed one at a time. It removes them one at a time, yeah. Okay. Uh, is the one not, not one at a time, so it removes them in sequence in this case. You may also want to just remove remove everything one at a time from the overall system and not to you know decrease. This one removes them in a sequence, and then that brings the question of in which order should I remove them? Maybe if I change the order, this is not the um, finding I want. So there, there are some um, things that we can criticize about this example. But the general idea is basically remove things from your system and see how much that removal affects the <coughs> performance. Um, so this advice uh, is also something I agree with. Um, premature optimization. So let's say you're starting on a problem. You build this highly complex model and you try to optimize it. Um, and then you get to a certain point um, and you've spent most of the semester doing this. So and not much time to learn anything from your experiments. That puts you in a tough position. Okay? It's much uh, better, especially for this class, to build something that works end to end. That's your purpose for this baseline assignment. Okay? So you want to build some piece of code that's simple, but that basically solves your whole problem from beginning to end, possibly with bad performance. And then we basically add things on top of this. At every point in this cycle, you have a working system. And hopefully your working system version 5 is better than your working system version 4. Oh, I guessed. Um, uh, in, the, in the other case, you basically spend the whole semester building this thing. And then when your first experiments fail, and it's the last week of the semester, you're done. Right? So there's nothing that you can do. So you always want to have something working. Your last working model should always be you know, something that you keep dearly. And then you uh, fiddle with it a bit more to make it better. And if you proceed this way, number one, uh, it's safer. Number two, you automatically have your error analysis actually done for you, or ablative analysis. Basically, every time you add a component, you do new experiments and see if this component is actually helping. OK. Um, let me see. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a bit more about uh, things that we listed. Um, I think I'm done talking about overfitting, underfitting. Uh, let me say a few more things about the objective function. Um, PR, and I also want to talk about blue. Okay, so we, we saw a simple example where the objective function may not actually align with the, act, the thing that you're uh, trying to optimize. Uh, one very frequently encountered case of this is unbalanced data sets. Okay? So right now, Alkan and I are trying to uh, solve this estimation problem where we're looking at a DNA sequence and figure out in, at which positions of this DNA sequence a particular protein is likely to attach, okay? Now, um, out of the, you know, 100 million positions or so, only 1 million positions are positive examples. So the positive example, act, you know, ratio is 1%. So what happens when you uh, deal with a problem like this? Uh, you give it to any neural network or linear model or whatever, 
uh, it tells you, aha, I got 99% accuracy by labeling everything negative. Okay, that's something that very that is very very hard to beat. Okay, so most learning algorithms never get off the ground because they already have 99% accuracy. Why should they do the extra work? So, in that case, we need two things. We number one, we need some method to get the learning off the ground. Okay, and we do that by uh, balancing the data. So you can balance the data by oversampling or undersampling. So in, in, in our case, we have lots of data, so we can undersample the negative examples to make their count equal to the positive examples. So I always want to work with roughly equal class counts, if I can. Okay. So I solve that version of the problem. I get the best model I can. That will give me the um, answers on this balanced data. And then, before I apply it to the real data, I play with the biases. I put a much higher threshold on my positive answer to get the 1% uh, again. Okay? What yes? Well, at the end of the thing, you're basically giving a yes-no answer, and there is a bias in that layer. Right? So, your raw score comes in. And that raw score, if it's above a certain threshold, is going to give you more than 50% probability. And you're going to say yes. If it's below a threshold, you're going to say no. Right? But I can move that threshold. I can say, I, want, I don't want my threshold at 0. I want my threshold at 10. If you put the threshold much higher, then your yes answers are going to naturally reduce to the ones that you're most confident with. Why did you do this, like, with the whole data before understanding? Um, you can't get the learning off the ground. The, there is just too little signal. You're basically 99 times saying no is the correct answer, no is the correct answer, no is the correct answer, okay? And every once in a while there's a yes, and the gradients from that are not enough to actually push you in the right direction, okay? So the gradient descent doesn't work in that case. So that's one, method number one. And then method number, uh, the problem number two is how do we actually measure performance? Um, is accuracy a really good measure of performance? Okay, so 99% uh, is the baseline accuracy. If I do very good, I don't know, 9.2%, is that good? I mean, it's, uh, I'm dealing with these very small numbers, very small differences, which is very upsetting, okay? So what you instead want to do in a case like this uh, is do something like precision recall analysis. Precision is the percentage of uh, um, correct things you return. Uh, it can be, and then recall, let me see how to express this. Um, so let's say uh, there's a, a thousand instances, 10 true, 990 false, okay, and you return 15 returned as positive, okay, so in this example, precision would be um, 15 returned as positive, and let's say 7 of them are true positives. Okay, do you get the story here? So I had only 10 positive examples out of 1,000. Uh, my algorithm said yes to 15 things, and 7 out of those 15 things were actually uh, positive. So if this is the case, then precision means uh, 7 over 15, and recall is 7 over 10. So let's see if I can express this in English now. 
precision is basically the ratio of the correct things you returned to everything you returned as positive. Whereas recall is how much of the correct things in the whole data set did you return to? Okay. Now these are um, in the unbalanced data cases um, a lot better in terms of measuring your performance. Any questions about wrong objectives or different objectives? Um, May I? Yes. Uh, so, we have to look like the of all the answers and then before we add them together, we multiply them with correct labels. Then we have a calculating loss. Yes, we have a calculating mm -hmm. loss. We have a truth table and we multiply it with the Sure. So, what did we, uh, for example, the parameter that gave more weight to, uh, for example, the scarcer labels. So you're suggesting a possible solution to the unbalanced data problem. Let's. Um, let's discuss offline. But I, I I don't have an answer to give you. I have to try it and see and understand what you're proposing to implement. Um, okay, so let me talk about train dev test uh, data distributions. This is another problem we're working on right now. Um, so in this case, Ali and John are working on uh, detecting whether or not two proteins that are both close together and touching each other will actually dock or not. Okay? So usually proteins work by uh, attaching to each other, but they only attach to each other if particular uh, amino acids are actually aligned correctly in the interface. Uh, and that, um, you can try to figure that out using a molecular dynamics simulator, or uh, as we're trying right now, we can write a convolutional neural network that does three-dimensional convolutions and learns these patterns that basically allow these things to duck. Okay? Um, and in that particular case, we have the problem of um, multiple data sets. So there is a lot of different data sets out there that actually has uh, true positives, uh, real protein pairs that duck each other. And people also, for machine learning purposes, have generated negative examples. How would you then generate a negative example? Well, let's say I have two proteins that actually like docking this way. Okay? I use a molecular dynamics program and then you know, just try to attach them in other ways, and I basically record all of these as negatives, because they don't like touching each other in other places. Okay? So, um, but now, we take one data set, we train and test on it, we get 92% accuracy, let's say. And then we test it on another data set, and we get 60% accuracy. What does that mean? No, I actually split my first data set into train, test, dev. I did everything properly, so I know it's generalizing. That's right. So the, the data sources are different. So the distributions are different. So there's different types of positive examples, different types of negative examples that don't exist in my training set. Okay? So here's another example. You're writing a, uh, this is from uh, Andrew in his book. Uh, you're writing an app for recognizing cats and images, and you train it using Google Photos on the internet. Okay? But then when people start taking pictures with their cell phones, your model doesn't work as well. Maybe in your training uh, you basically estimated 99% accuracy and when people start taking pictures with their cell phones it's 80% accuracy now. What happened? Again the distributions are different. The cell phones have smaller cameras or worse lighting or 
whatever. So the, the nature of the photos that people are taking with their cell phones are different from the nature of the photos you actually use for training. Okay. So um, it is important to look at where the data is coming from, unless you have a monolithic data set and you're randomly sitting in the train their test, which usually happens in academic exercises, but rarely happens in real world applications. You need to be careful about where these distributions are coming from, what, what the data sources are, and whether they're actually coming from the same distribution. Ideally, your dev and test sets should come from the same distribution. And this distribution should be the same as what you expect your future users to bring to you. Okay? Now, more ideally, even the training set should be from the same distribution. Everybody should be from the same distribution. Then all our assumptions are correct and everything works perfectly. But if you can't accomplish that, at the very least, make sure your dev and test are from the same distribution, even if they're, it's not the same as train, but they, they're from the same distribution that your users actually care about. Okay? So training set is for optimizing parameters. Dev set is for simulating what's going to happen on test. And test set is for simulating what's going to happen on the user application. Okay? So unless dev, test, and the user application are coming from the same uh, distribution, then all your optimization, hyperparameter optimization, early stopping, etc., might not be optimized to um, increase the performance for the end user. Okay? So that's the. Um, so that's the summary. So you want, if you can't get train and everything, everything the same distribution as the train, which is the ideal thing, then at the very least you want dev. Uh, and test and the future data to come from the same distribution. Okay, any questions about that? All right. Um, hypothesis testing. Let me spend one minute on this. So let's say uh, you tried model A, uh, it gives you 72% on test set. You try model B, it gives you 70% on test set. Can you claim that A is better than B? Why, why not? What does it depend on? Well, it depends on the set actually, the beta set. The test set. Tested. What about the test set? If you like shop, uh, use different samples of the data uh -huh. set, uh, as tested, uh -huh. then uh, the performance will differ. So this kind maybe of will maybe won't. How, how do we know? By time, I, will, but, uh, I think it would change because we are using different. So let's say my test set has ten million examples in it. Okay. So if I sampled another 10 million examples, do you think it would actually change? The results would change? Yeah, from the same distribution. Yeah, everything is from the same distribution. This could change. So the important thing is the size of the test set. Okay? So the, we're basically uh, measuring a percentage by sampling. Okay? So uh, my, my true question is, what is my accuracy on the whole population of unseen data? And my surrogate for that information is the result on a test set that has finite amount of data. I can actually ca calculate the mean and the variance of this thing relatively easily. So let's say n is the test size. Um, I don't know, p is the real accuracy of some algorithm. And Q is the predicted accuracy. Um, so Q is equal to, so let's say, X1 through Xn divided by N, where um, X1 is the indicator variable 1 if 
correct, zero if incorrect. Right, so predicted accuracy is basically uh, for each example in the test set, I have one indicator variable, one or zero, correct, incorrect, right? And I'm adding them all up and I'm, I'm dividing by n. That gives me the average um, percentage of correct answers on the test set, and that's how I actually estimate Q. Now, I can ask the standard statistical questions. What is the expected value of Q? Q is a random variable. That depends on my uh, XIs. What is the variance of Q? Anybody have any answers on these? P is the probability. Expected value of Q. P is the actual probability, yes. P is the actual probability of these XIs being 1. So then we have the multinomial distribution for the prediction accuracy? Sure. Any guesses as to the expectation and variance of this random variable? Each of the XIs are Bernoulli random variables, they're coin tosses. Each XI has a chance P chance of being correct and 1 minus P of being incorrect, right? I'm adding n of them and taking an average. What is the expectation? What's the variance? Yes? It's, it's, it's supposed to be P, but you never know P. The, the but part is not necessary. So expectation is P. What's the variance? P one minus P divided by square root of n. Okay? Um, actually, variance is n. Uh, so when we actually do standard deviation, it's going to be square root of n. Okay? So that means, um, so let's put some numbers. So if n is 100 and p, I'm always going to assume p is roughly 0 0.5, okay? Or actually, let's, let's assume it's 75 or something. Um, so basically, p1 minus p over n is always going to be uh, smaller than 1 over 4n. Is that right? P, b, p equal to 1 over 2 is the worst case. Any, anything else is going to make the variance lower. Okay. So this upper bound means the standard deviation is lower than 1 over 2 square root of n. Right? So that means if I have n equals 100, square root of n is 10, and my standard deviation is 1 over 20. 1 over 20 is what? 5%. Okay? If that's the standard deviation of my estimate, then the difference between a and b right now look like not very significant, okay? Just 2% difference in a situation where your standard error is 5% is not a very significant result. You can do the Z tests and whatever, look at Wikipedia and figure it out. But basically, back of the envelope, looking at this, you can immediately tell this difference is insignificant because the difference you're measuring compared to the actual um, standard deviation of this random variable is very small. Whereas if n was, let's say, 10,000, um, then standard deviation would be uh, 1 over 200, right? So that's half percent. If your standard deviation is half percent and the difference you're measuring is 2 percent, then you can get excited, okay? At least, you know, most likely this thing is statistically significant in some measure of the term. So this, uh, so whether the, to answer my own question, whether or not this difference is important depends only on one thing, and one thing only, size of your test set, nothing else. Okay? Size of your test set determines your standard deviation, your standard deviation determines whether a particular difference is significant or not. So. When you're actually trying to pick a test set out of a big data set, you're basically splitting things up and whatever, you're thinking, oh, should I put one third of the thing to the test set or one fifth of the thing to the test set? Well, the only reason you have a test set is to make these measurements. So make the test set big enough so that the standard deviation is small enough for your measurements, okay? 
So if half a percent is enough for you to tell the differences, then there is no reason to put more than 10,000 things in your, in your test set. It's just waste of data. But if half a percent is not enough, you want fine grain, finer grained accuracy, then by all means put more stuff in your test set. But always realize why you're doing it. The only reason to put more examples in your test set is to reduce this standard deviation so that uh, smaller differences are um, able to be distinguished from each other. Any questions about this? Yeah. Chuck, you assume a binomial distribution for motivating your argument, but if there's a binomial, there, there's a model. That's, that, that's actually the distribution. Nothing matters. None of that matters. Model or no model, each time I take an example and I ask, did this model do right on this example? That's a yes, no question. Okay? And there is an actual underlying probability that my algorithm will do correctly on this example. That's P. P is the only parameter that matters in this whole example. None of the other things matter. Yes, the distribution is binomial. And it's always going to be binomial even if you're using a 100 layer neural network. That's irrelevant. The only relevant fact here is, uh, what is the probability that my model, whatever model that is, is going to take one test instance and answer it correctly? That's one number, P. And then you're trying to estimate P. Any other questions? OK. I'm almost, I think, said everything I wanted to say. Um, Matrix and hypothesis testing, yeah, the, the rest is not important, okay. Ensembles we already talked about. Um, I was going to show you a sample problem, but I'll give you as a homework example. So let's say you have uh, a model that in a binary problem only does 60% accuracy, okay? But somehow you basically manage to train uh, 100 copies of this model, each slightly different each roughly having a 60% you know, accuracy on this problem. And we're going to assume that they're so different from each other that their errors are uncorrelated. Okay? So each of them make an error on a particular instance independently of all the others. If that's the case, then assembling would be using all these 100 models together, giving all of them the same instance, and then some of them will say yes, some of them will say no, you take the majority vote. Okay? So my question to you, it should take you five minutes to answer in Julia, is basically what is the um, accuracy of the ensemble under these assumptions as you change the number of models n from one to let's say a hundred. Okay? So what is the probability of the getting the correct answer from an ensemble of 100 models, each of which are simple and only have 60% accuracy using majority vote. That's my exercise for you. I'll uh, collect answers in the next lecture.